Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that you have the power to change us, that you have the power to change the way we think, the things we want, that you have the power to give us peace in the midst of turmoil, and God, that you understand the hard things that we go through, and you don't take them lightly, and you certainly do not allow them in our lives in a way that you are flippant about it, Lord, because you love us so very much, and we thank you. So, Lord, would you take tonight and speak to our hearts, encourage us, uh, stir us, Lord, to want to follow in the footsteps of, of Paul, and more than that, your footsteps, Jesus, and we ask this in your name. Amen. You know, I was looking down at my notes this morning and was like, wow, I just get right into the study. And when I have to teach at a retreat, I can't get right into the study because I know the first 10 minutes everybody's analyzing me. And so you almost have to tell a funny story or something like that. And when I looked down, I thought, I love my ladies. You know, that I don't have to do all that. That, you know, you're ready to go, I'm ready to go. So. Look at the last verse that we studied last week. And part of Paul's prayer was that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. So the goal being to the praise and glory of God. Now, how did, how did you see that when we looked at it last week? You know. What kind of fruits of righteousness or acts of righteousness or behavior lead to the praise and glory of God? And, and I love the transition here into verse 12 because now Paul's going to show us. He's going to show us the attitude that leads to the praise and glory of God. What righteous fruits of righteousness look like. So we've arrived at the second part of Paul's letter to the Philippians. They had seen God do an incredible miracle, that great earthquake that shook the foundations of the prison, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. But look at what was recorded in verse 35 of Acts 16. And when it was day, the next morning, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let those men go. The magistrates were totally unaware of the fact that God had already set them free. But as I stared at that, as I was working on the message, I thought, so why did God set them free? If he knew they were going to be set free the next morning, why did he bother with the earthquake? Because it wasn't just for Paul and Silas, was it? It was for the Philippian jailer and his family. Remember, they got saved through it. The, the faith of the Philippian, new Philippian believers was was increased and affected. See, in other words, the power of God was made known. The gospel was furthered in lives because of that miracle. So certainly it was to the praise and glory of God. Yet in Paul's other imprisonments, he remained chained. But he remained chained for the same purpose that God broke the chains in Philippi, the spreading of the gospel. See, Paul got it. The Philippian believers, he wasn't sure if they were getting it or not. So he's writing this letter to them to encourage them. And so in this section, we see an incredibly wonderful contrast. It was a little more difficult to locate. So if you're doing your homework, I gave it to you uh, because it, it took me a while to see it. Usually the, the contrasting words are within a verse or two of each other, but this wasn't. Philippians 1.7 says that Paul was chained. Now, listen to these synonyms for the word chained. Confined, bound, fixed, hitched, strapped, constrained, impeded. Ever feel like that when you're in a trial? You know, those words can describe what we feel like sometimes. And then we have this contrasting word in verse 12. Furtherance, advancement. Profit, drive forward, progress. You could look at Paul and say, oh, he's chained. 
He's so limited in what he can do. He's strapped. And Paul says, don't think that way of these chains because these chains are enabling the gospel to go forward. What was it that Paul wanted them to know, and us too, that sometimes the gospel is furthered by us being set free from a trial, and sometimes it is furthered by us being chained to a trial. You and I have got to examine our goal when hard times hit us. See, Paul's goal was the gospel. So after the introductory words of this letter, Paul shifts to let them know, this is how I'm doing. This is what's going on in my life. See, before you, you give in to uh, the thoughts, say, well, yeah, right, but Paul was called to preach the gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, speaking to you and to me as believers. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, but you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Same calling, isn't it? Paul knew his calling was to glorify God. Our calling as believers is to glorify God. So I want to take a few minutes and, and set the stage for you. Paul, after being arrested in Jerusalem and going through several trials there, he appealed to Caesar and he had an agenda. Paul had a plan. And it said he purposed in the spirit when we had, he had passed through Macedonia and Kai to go to Jerusalem. And when he was there, he was said, after I've been there, I must also go to Rome. When he was in Corinth, he wrote to the Romans writing, so as much as is in me, I'm ready. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Rome was the center of the world. To conquer Rome for Christ would be to convert thousands and thousands of people. But God had bigger plans than that. You know, that's a big plan. I'm going to the biggest city in the entire world and I'm going to preach the gospel. That was his plan. But God had plans for Paul to be in prison and to reach millions by confining him by placing him in chains and enabling him to write. So he was sent by ship across the Mediterranean Sea, thousands of miles. And when they landed at Rome, he was with other prisoners and Luke was with him. They delivered the other prisoners to the captain of the guard and they placed Paul under what is called house arrest. Now these are the last two verses of Acts. We don't have the rest of Paul's life, we have these last two verses describing this time that we're studying about now. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. I love those last words, you know, no one forbidding him, freely, unhindered, in chains. Every other place Paul had gone, many had forbidden him to preach the gospel. He was stoned, he was whipped, he was kicked out of cities. He was illegally arrested in Jerusalem. Think for a minute of all the ways Satan and the religious Jews tried to stop him and nothing, absolutely nothing worked to stop Paul. And although Paul would later experience the dungeon type prison, and we'll look at some pictures of that in a while, uh, even beheaded for his faith, this time, this time of the writing of the Philippians, instead of a regular prison, God allowed him to be put under house arrest where no one, no one forbid him from preaching and teaching. And praise God, no one forbid him from writing. So Paul's plan to reach thousands ended up reaching millions. And through this time of imprisonment, Paul was able to preach the gospel, disciple others, and write the letters of Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Now, let me back up a minute and, and let's look at kind of what it was like, uh, this type of imprisonment. He was chained to a Roman guard 
at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two years. And it's believed that guards probably pulled either four to six hour duty times. So he's with four to six guards a day. What do you think that must have been like? I, I mean, for me, the first thing I would think of is, you know what, I would need space. You know, being attached to someone all the time uh, makes me really anxious. And I mean, I don't know what the guards were like, but I imagine Paul was chained to a lot of different personalities, some probably quiet and congenial, while others were probably loud and obnoxious, maybe an obscene joke here and there, crude stories, maybe just a talker, you know, a guard for four to six hours just talk and talk and talk and never stop, and then to know tomorrow the guard comes back and he's going to talk and talk and talk and never stop again. Just wait, you know. He doesn't have a watch, but you know, maybe in a in a couple hours, you know, the, the next guard will be different. Paul never got a break. And I always think that I think I could take almost anything if I knew there was a break. Uh, when I had kidney stones this summer, uh, a lot of people come up and say, I hear it's worth worse than childbirth. Is it? And I say, Yes. You know why? Because in childbirth, when you have contractions, you get a break. And you hang in there till that, that break time. But kidney stones, you don't get a break. And see, that's what it was like for Paul, just guard after guard after guard for two years. But you know what? I don't think when we read about Paul here, he paid too much attention to how the guards were affecting him. Because Paul's mindset was, how am I going to affect these guards? And he did. But not only Paul, Paul got most of the credit here, which he gave to the Lord. But remember, he was able to freely receive all who came to visit him. And think about who that was that we just know about. In Philippians 2, Paul mentions sending Timothy to Philippi. So Timothy was with him. Epaphroditus was able to visit Paul several times. In the closing verses to Colossians, and remember he wrote to the Colossians at this time, he lists some of them who were with him as he was writing. Tychicus, Onesimus. Remember, Onesimus was the slave that Paul probably led to the Lord, and then he sent back to Philemon. Mark was back with him. And Luke had traveled with him from Jerusalem. In this letter, Paul says, Timothy was with me. Imagine all these saints, you know, these great ministers of the gospel, all sitting around just talking about the Lord, his word, worshiping, praying, singing. And there's always a guard chained. Got to listen. Got to listen to them sing. Got to listen to them as they, they bring in people that, that are curious about Jesus and end up giving their lives to Jesus. Who's chained? Paul or the guards? See, some of our greatest opportunities to witness are times when we know that our conversation is being overheard by someone. You, know, you run into somebody in the market, talk about the Lord, just not obnoxiously, but, you know, what you, what you learn in your devos, you know? What's the Lord showing you? And the people around have to listen. And they learn a little bit about Jesus, and it's a really easy way to witness Day in and day out for these guards, they were exposed to the gospel. They were exposed to people coming in and seeking answers and listening to Paul lead them to the Lord. So many of the guards, we're told, were saved. Also, think about what it must have been like for these guards to go back to the barracks every day. Verse 13 of our, our lesson says, so that it, it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. I bet, you know, can't you just picture it? You know, they probably started out, Paul's new. Who's this Paul guy? What did he do? Well, he got arrested for talking about some guy named Jesus. Who's Jesus? I don't know, but it seems like when you mention his name, either people <coughs> like it or they, they hate it. Have you talked to this Paul yet? 
what does he say about this Jesus? You know, I can just imagine the conversations. And then after a while, after the guards had been with him for a certain amount of time, I can imagine questions like getting back to the barracks, like, what did he say today? You know, what did he talk to you about today? And then some being excited and others being irritated. But what awesome conversations they must have had. And somehow, the gospel filtered, filtered over to those in the household of Caesar himself. Philippians 4.22 says, All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. And I thought, you know, Paul was that, that go-getter, did he think? I'm going to get Caesar saved. You know, I'm going to get the, the ruler of all of Rome, of all of Italy, of the world. I'm going to get him saved. And God doesn't seem to have that much of an objective. You know, he's like, I'm after the people of the household. These people are every bit as important as Caesar. And the people, the regular people, were the ones that were getting saved. Now, I doubt that those in Caesar's household personally knew the Philippians. But oh, the love and appreciation that was probably behind that greeting. The Philippians had physically supported Paul during this imprisonment, and we'll read about that in chapter 4. And Paul's being there had allowed them to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, and those in Caesar's household were rejoicing. So, so far we can see that while Paul was in chains, people were getting saved. People were being discipled, and letters were being written that would change the lives of people for thousands of years. Certainly we all can bear witness to that. And one more thing in verse 14. Other Christians were becoming bolder in their faith and were out there preaching the word of God. You know, wouldn't looking at Paul in chains cause them to be more fearful, to be less bold? I mean, they had to be thinking, this could happen to me. I need to be careful who I talk to about Jesus. I need to be careful about when I talk about Jesus or where I could end up like Paul. Avoid suffering. That's the goal, right? Isn't that your goal and my goal sometimes? Just how do I avoid something bad happening to me? And they actually had the power to avoid imprisonment. All they had to do was keep their mouth shut about Jesus. See, don't we think like that? And, and we aren't even faced with chains, just disapproval, maybe mockery, maybe losing some friends. But seeing Paul kept, keep sharing Jesus and loving it, loving watching God work, it encouraged them. I'm guessing that amongst the success stories of people getting saved, there were a lot of soldiers that didn't get saved, that weren't buying it, who had hard hearts. And I'm sure that produced a lot of mocking when they were chained to Paul. Maybe, maybe striking him. Maybe doing something extra to try to take away his joy. And as I was thinking about that the other day, I, I thought of a friend of mine who came to the Lord and her husband was so unhappy. And uh, for three months, he just was horrible to her. And at the end of three months, she looked at him and he had just tears. And she said, what's wrong? And he said, I have tried to break you for three months and I can't seem to take away your faith. I want your Jesus, see? And so we don't know what's going on when, when people are giving us a hard time. Somehow these chains that were meant to confine Paul just released him. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.9, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. And Paul wrote that in the dungeon time. Paul wrote that when he knew his life was about to be over, still excited because the word of God can't be chained. Now, how does all of this affect you? In your groups, you will get a handout of a chart that's titled uh, 
The Purposes and Benefits of Affliction. And I kind of stared at that title, and even though I put the chart together, and I thought, Benefits of Affliction? Oh, that's interesting. That, that's an interesting phrase. You kind of think, well, purposes. I know there's purposes in affliction, but are there benefits? See, the Word of God says there are benefits, but do we see them as benefits? And the only way we will see them as benefits if, is we want what God wants. See, we look at scriptures like, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Why do we shy away from that? Because that's not what you want in a trial, is it? And when the trial hits, is that the first thing you think of? Wow, I've got an opportunity for patience. I can't wait. But see, we think that's a bad thing. And if we think it's a bad thing, we're not going to rejoice in a trial. But to realize God brings trials into our life, and one thing he wants to do is work this patience in us. Okay, Lord, you want to do this. I want this. And Paul got this. See, we see in this, this portion of Scripture that Paul rejoiced. And he says, I will rejoice. And sometimes we see rejoicing is a choice. In this hard time, I will choose to rejoice. And we should. But there was another reason for Paul's rejoicing, and it was the fact that he loved watching God work. He wanted what God was doing. And so when he saw God working, he could really rejoice and be happy in a trial. You've probably been in those kind of situations, you know, something hard is happening, but you see God do something or use you, and it's just like, yes, and you're rejoicing, even though you're in a hard place. And we see here, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, that knowing is our gnosko, you will learn this when you experience it. You'll experience patience in a trial. Paul's beliefs motivated his priorities, and Paul's priorities led to his attitude. Same applies to you and to me. In this lesson, um, the focus we'll take is to look at what Paul believed about affliction. The definition of affliction that I like is trials either directly sent or allowed by God for his divine purposes. Trials either directly sent by or allowed by God for his divine purposes. Do you believe that? See, if you do, you won't ask, why am I in this trial? You'll say, what does God want to do in this trial? Not, I wonder what God is doing to me in this, but I wonder what God can do through me in this. See, we've just got to believe that God has a purpose in our trials. And we've got to learn to look for those purposes. And you know what else? We've got to want his purposes. That's why Paul could rejoice, because he wanted the same things that God wanted. You that have remodeled a home, you know you'll put up with all the dust, all the inconvenience, all the hassles with the contractors. Why? Because you know in the end you're going to get a product, a part of your house that you really, really like. Something good's going to come out of it. Do we look at trials that way? Yes, hard, but God intends to do something in them and through them. Do you believe him? Think about all that God did through Paul's trial of imprisonment. See, do you want God to do things through your trials? Then let's see what we can learn from Paul. First, I want to look at uh, Paul's um, reactions as far as what he didn't do, Paul's don'ts. He did not grumble or complain. Now, we know God's view about grumbling and complaining. He really doesn't like it. So we would be wise not to grumble and complain when we're going through a trial. It's not going to help us. Complaining exhibits 
a lack of faith. It's basically saying, uh, I don't like what you're doing, God. I don't trust you. The psalmist declared in Psalm 77, I complained and my heart was overwhelmed. Isn't that so true? That's what happens when we complain. The opposite of complaining is what? Gratitude. Psalm 136, one says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Mercy, loving kindness, goodness, faithfulness, love, and acts of mercy. His acts of mercy endure forever towards you and towards me. See, is there a time that that's not true? That God is not good or that God is not displaying his mercy? And then secondly, he did not question God or his ways. He did not question God or his ways. And we'll go back to number two, but these two slides are verses. Romans 11:33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Job declared in Job 11, 7 and 8, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They're higher than the heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, hell. What can you know? Oh, that we would have Job's wisdom. Think about all Job had gone through. None of us have gone through what Job had gone through. And God didn't give him any answers. He didn't tell Job what he was doing. He just reminded Job of who he was. And Job was speechless. Let the Lord remind you of who he is when you are afflicted. Think of his character. Dwell on his truths. Choose to trust him. Paul, see, Paul knew he was there because of the will of God. Oh, what a difference that makes when we see that God has either directly brought a trial into our life or he has allowed it, that God says, I'm in this. We've got to remember that. And Paul knew, I'm where God wants me to be. That, that's a very good place to be. I was reading in my devos on Monday in Acts 17, and that's a chapter right after the story of Paul and Silas being in jail in Philippi. And now they're in Thessalonica, again preaching the gospel. But look at what verse 3 says. This is what Paul was doing, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. See, just as much as our salvation is dependent on the fact that Jesus rose from the grave, our salvation is dependent on the fact that Jesus had to suffer. He despised what he went through. He hated what he went through. And he was very open to another way. Remember in the garden, Father, if there, there be another way, take this cup from me, take this trial from me. See, God doesn't take suffering lightly. There are times when you and I have to suffer for God's purposes, for his purposes to be accomplished. God only allows suffering when it has to be. You gotta get that. He doesn't flippantly allow his children to suffer. He only allows it when it has to be to accomplish his purposes in us and in others. So we would be wise to look for those purposes, to just even remind ourselves. We don't have to see it. We just have to know God's got a purpose in this, and it's always good. When we challenge him and we doubt him, we're only hindering what he wants to do. Now, word of caution, it is true that God ordains or allows trials, but, but sometimes we bring them on ourselves, don't we? You know, and we can't really, you know, he allowed that, but what we brought on our own consequences. And he allows those things very often to teach us a lesson. He promises you will reap what you sow. There are consequences for our sins. But even then, see, if we've repented of our sins, 
God wants to use even those consequences for something good. It's like he, he just says, watch what I can do with this. God, I've made such a mess out of this, but I'm so sorry. And he says, watch what I can do. He can always work through things. I, I, I've shared I hurt my shoulder trying to throw a ball as hard, a wiffle ball as hard as a 15-year-old boy, and it, it just hurts. It hurts all the time. And, you know, I think part of what bothers me about it is I, I did it to myself. You know, it's my own fault. I can't say, oh, this accident happened to me. It's my fault that it happened. And, and just this last Sunday night, I thought, but God always has a plan B. Even if God didn't intend for me to be that stupid, which he didn't, he didn't intend for me to suffer with his shoulder. It's like he says, but I, have, I can do something with this. Are you open? Or are you just going to complain that your shoulder hurts? And it just helped me. The pain didn't go away, but it's just been different knowing, okay, Lord, you can do something with this. Have your way in this, Lord. I'm going to watch for ways that you can use this. If we've not repented, then God will use whatever means he needs to to bring us to that place of repentance so he can do something with what we've done. And then thirdly, he was not ashamed of the gospel. Paul was not only not embarrassed to preach the gospel, he was not embarrassed about the effects of being a Christian, about the hard times. So often people will tell me how they don't feel comfortable in, in telling others about the Lord because they'll say, look at my life. Look at the situation I'm in. Look at my marriage. Why would anyone want to be a Christian when they look at me? But let me remind you of Philippians 1, 13 and 14. Paul says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become crucified, confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They all knew why Paul was suffering. It was because he surrendered to Jesus. None of this would have happened if Paul hadn't surrendered to Jesus, if he just kept his mouth shut. Yet people were getting saved, and others were getting bolder in their faith. They were getting stronger, not weaker. How can that be? Because people long to find something that is worth dying for. They long to see a power that sustains through trials, that gives joy and affliction. See, you look at someone that has their life all together or apparently does, and you think, well, they're happy because look at their life. When someone's going through a trial and you see joy, you say, how do you do that? How do you have joy and affliction? And you can say, it's Jesus. How do you have peace in hard times? It's Jesus. People are not attracted to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of people who have their lives together. Trials reveal what we are really made of, that as we learned last week, that we're sincere without wax. Remember that we cover up cracks with wax and when the sun started shining brightly when the trial hits, you would see what they were really like. Trials prove if our faith is real or not. So. Paul was not ashamed of the circumstances he was in. In 2 Timothy 1.12, he says, For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. He is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. 2 Timothy, this is where we believe he was in uh, maritime prison in Rome. There's actually a plaque over the prison that says uh, the Apostle Paul was here. This is the, the situation, the, the place that he was living in when he is rejoicing. The circumstances were God's problem because they were God's doing. Paul's job was to shine in those circumstances. You know, the little 
children's song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's our job. See, our job is to shine. And people need to see a light that stays lit in the darkest of places. And you and I, we get to be that light if we want to. So Paul watched his attitude. It was not negative. He did not doubt God. He was not ashamed of the circumstances he was in. So what did he do? Three things I see. He had the right attitude towards God. See, what thoughts go through our mind about God when we're in a trial? How many of those thoughts about the Lord and his intentions are true? Sometimes it's, okay, right now this is what I believe, writing it down and then looking at them and then saying, is that really true? What does scripture say? When you think of a trial or affliction being ordained or designed by God, what do you think of him? And then he had the right attitude towards himself. God's the potter, potter we're the clay. So number one, God's good. The potter's good. Number two, the clay needs to be pliable, usable. The best thing for the clay is to be pliable and usable in the potter's hands. See, is our life soft, pliable, usable clay? When the master touches you, you know, applies a little bit of pressure, what do you do? Do you stiffen up? Do you draw back? Because you can't work in us when we do that. Or do you melt? Just melt to that pressure because you know, my Lord's touching me. My Lord's putting that pressure on me. Think for a moment of pottery that's hard and dried up. It's just thrown over in a trash heap. It can't be used. But pottery that's soft and pliable has been made into what the designer purposes for it. Now, since we have in the Lord a designer who, whose purposes are always good, shouldn't we yield to him and work with him rather than against him? Do you really think our Lord has had any pot that is pliable and made something ugly? It doesn't happen. And then thirdly, he kept God's purpose in sight. Whatever and whoever came Paul's way, he looked for an opportunity to glorify the Lord. It wasn't what don't I have, but who do I have in my life? I've got these Roman guards. Okay, I'll witness to them. Look at the last verses of our, and he had, had to adapt because remember his dream was, I'm going to witness to the people in Rome. And now he's, he's chained. And he doesn't look at what he could have done and what his dream was, but, but wait a minute, okay, what do I have now in front of me? Then that's my, my field to represent Jesus to. Verses 15 to 18 say, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. See, this isn't talking about those that are out there preaching contrary to the word of God, tweaking the word of God, stretching it, teaching another gospel. He's talking about the motive that some are using in preaching the real word of God, the true gospel, the motive of selfish ambition, the motive of praise of the people, the motive of, I just want to be better than that guy down the street, you know, bad motives. But Paul says, I'm not going to mess with those. I'm going to be about the gospel. If Jesus is being preached, that's all I care about. See, some were preaching out of envy. It was like, Whoa, the great apostle Paul's in town. And people are taking people to meet him. And people are getting saved. Oh, and sometimes you look at a ministry like that, I want that. And they preach the gospel, but, but their heart is like, I, I want something out of that. Paul says, I'm just going to be about Jesus. I'm going to be about the gospel. 
And he didn't bother taking time to challenge or deal with those who had wrong motives. He rejoiced Jesus was being preached. Attached to my notes from the message I, I taught 20 years ago in this passage was a letter from the sister-in-law of my mentor, Carolyn. And she wrote the letter from a prison cell. She was 59 years old and, and truly not guilty. She had been accused of a white-collar crime and, and hadn't committed it, but through a series of what you and I would call mishaps, she ended up in prison. And I went to visit her one day, uh, months after I began writing to her, and it was winter, and she was cold. And she had been on a work detail outside and didn't even have a sweater. Her bed had no blankets, and what I saw of the guards was cruelty, not physical abuse, but demeaning, harsh words. She'd lost weight, and she just looked so frail. And yet I watched her choose Jesus, and she chose to thank him, and she chose to worship him. And she chose to notice the birds outside of her prison cell and reminded me, hey, you know how much God cares about those birds? He cares more about us. And here's just part of the letter that she sent to me. She said, I continue to pray that I will be used of God and that I will be able to concentrate on his love for me and grow in his grace. I will not allow, I will not wallow in self-pity because it only detracts from God's great love for us. I must continue to focus on Jesus, my King of Kings. See, do you know what that says to me? It says, we can't look at 2,000 years ago and say, oh, that was the great Apostle Paul. We have someone in our day, glorifying Jesus just like Paul did. That says, I can do it and you can do it because it's our great God that we need to be about, not, not our strengths and our attributes. Paul gave his life up for Jesus and the gospel. He looked at who was in his life and how he could affect them for Christ's sake. And in the midst of being chained, caused Paul not only to accept his trial, but find reasons to rejoice in it. And I have found that when I'm disappointed in, in God, when I'm in a trial, it's because I'm expecting God to be someone that he never promised to be. I don't know our God. The glorious contrast, see, Chains don't mean that you and I are bound. Chains very often can be an opportunity to further the gospel, an opportunity for people to look at our lives and glorify and praise our God. Will you pray with me? Father, help us to get this. Lord, deep down into our lives, may we see that we can live with the attitude that Paul did, that Lorianne did. And Lord, that we can live lives that bring glory and praise to you. May we want that, Lord. May we know that no matter what hits us and slams us, you know what you're doing. And you always have a purpose. Help us to shine for you. Remind us to shine for you. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We have Sherry. And that means we're going to have a bulk of time to worship. Let's worship. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord. He's my refuge and my fortress, my God.
shall deliver you, and he shall cover you, and under his wings you shall take refuge, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. can't see you anymore. <laughs> Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that Breathing in life again, you cause your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song, Jesus, we love. Now 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you, holy, there is no
Father, we thank you that you're holy, and there is no one like you. You're light, and there's no darkness in you at all. You are holy. And God, I pray for anyone here right now that do feel all those synonyms that went with chained, locked up and bound. And God, I pray that by your spirit that guides us into the truth, that you would lift up our minds to your holiness, that you're light, and there's no darkness in you at all. And you're not even capable of an unloving thought towards us. Wash us clean of any false image we're holding of you and extinguish any lies that have been shot at us during these times. And I do pray, God, that you would fill our hearts with your heart and that you would lead us in your love to those that are around us, God. What an example in Paul that he's just a man and we're just people, we're just women, weak, but your spirit is strong. So fill us, Lord. We love you. We put our eyes on you. You bring the lonely a family. You calm the restless storm in me. You bring. This whole world could not contain all the wonders 
sense you give If I wrote down all you've done Every volume one by one This whole world could not contain All the wonders since you song fill me and the song's kind of been refreshed to my heart this year when I read in Luke about where Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness and he goes through all the temptation and and he got really hungry <laughs> and then it says in the end of it that he left in the power of the Holy Spirit and a 16-year-old girl that I was reading, we were reading the same thing together, texted me and said, yeah, Jesus needs the Holy Spirit. How much more do I? And it just happened, she texted me, and I was kind of in a heap on my couch. <laughs> I was just having a hard time. Sometimes I get knocked down physically and sometimes emotionally. And as I sat there, I just asked the Lord, can you lead me? right now, even in this heap, <laughs> even this weak and tired, can, can you just lead me? And can you fill me with the power of your spirit even now? See, I, I pray those prayers before I get in front of people or for things that I'm scared about. <laughs> you know. And he came in the most gentle way. And I got up. <laughs> And I'm thinking today and, and that powerful message. And yet, it's all about the power of the Holy Spirit in us, isn't it? And we can get to work. Yes, Lord, I want to do that for you. I want to be like that. <laughs> I do. And we throw up our hands and say, okay, fill me. Lead me. It's that simple. Holy Spirit, the Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. I need you now. I need your power to walk with boldness in this hour. Holy Spirit, the Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. I need you now, I need your power to walk with boldness in this hour. Search my heart, cleanse this temple. Spirit, the Father. 
Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. I need you now, I need your power to walk with boldness in this hour. Holy Spirit, the Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. I need you now, I need your power to walk with boldness in this hour. Search my heart, cleanse this temple, holy one, only you are able to take I was thinking about Paul and Silas in that, that prison cell in Acts, and we're told that they sang. You know, what do you, what do you think they sang? You know, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, think I'll eat some worms? No, you know, they, they praised. You wanted me to sing that, didn't you? Um, but they praised, and, and what happened was, God did this breaking of the chains, the physical chains in the, in the cell. And that's a wonderful thing. That, that's a miracle. And sometimes he breaks the chains of a trial, just done. But you know what I'd rather he do in my life than do that? Break the chains of my heart. You know, break the chains of fear. Break the chains of doubt. You know, that's the big miracle. So sometimes he breaks those physical chains... And that's a sometime, but see, always, always he is able to break the chains in our heart, the, the fear and the doubts and things like that. And may we rejoice that our God is a chain breaker. <laughs> 